Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 89 of Interstellar Quest and we follow on immediately from our previous episode with the remains of the EVE Explorer burning up in spectacular style over the poles with the aurora in all and the tantalizing glimpses that the mission offered us off the surface of EVE have convinced us that we would like to send an actual crew there so I've been developing an aircraft and so I'm actually going to include a bunch of development, a bunch of testing that I've done on my aircraft. Uh, I'm going to use an aircraft because EVE has a higher gravity than Kerbin so you want to make sure that you can take off. With the higher gravity there's no guarantee you can build a spacecraft that would be able to land and uh, lift off again directly. So yeah, we're uh, this thing does pretty well, it pulls into a 30 degree climb and continues to accelerate past Mach 1. Look at it go, this is just a test right now. Look at those Mach effects rippling across the surface as the air uh, causes moisture con to condense out of it, creating clouds that are attached to the surface. Oh yes, Ferrum instrumentation is warning us that we have high dynamic pressure. That's okay, we are testing this thing, but let's uh, throttle back just a little until we drop down to a nominal flight status. Okay, doing pretty well, just past 5 kilometers up. Let's... Uh, well, I think what we'll do is we've demonstrated that we've pulled this into a beautiful climb and it has power to weight ratio coming in oodles. Let's uh, try turning it around. So I want to slow down a bit because if I just immediately try to turn at this speed and this thickness of atmospheres, very likely the aircraft will break. But I, I kind of just want to get an idea of how well this thing performs. So... Here we go, and yes, okay, well that worked not very well at all. So it looked like we snapped at about 5 or 6 G, the nose just came off, as did the tail. I mean, that's not surprising because the wings were attached to the midsection and the tail, and the nose didn't have anything. Now obviously, in real life, you would do this kind of thing in a computer simulation, which is what I'm doing if you think about it. But uh, yeah, just to point out that I am playing by my own rules, I do have a parachute and an escape system attached. Bob and Jebediah can fling themselves free and, well, of course, Jebediah is no doubt collecting notes on the way down as to how the rest of the aircraft is performing so we can make a, a report. See, even after a rapid unplanned disassembly, I'm sure Jebediah is still collecting data as he watches the pieces fly in their own direction, off in their own way. I'm sure he is mentally plotting their courses and figuring out how they would fly if you were able to control them and then relaying that data back to the boys in the lab so they can build a better aircraft. Now, while we prepare for the next test flight or simulation, we return to Minmus, where Billy Bobkus Kerman and uh, Seanlock Kerman are, uh, well, they're doing some exploring, aren't they? Now, if you remember, we figured out that uh, we couldn't simultaneously, we couldn't reset our science because you needed two Kerbals to sit in the lab to perform the lab operations. And uh, I did not have a probe attached, so I would need a third Kerbal on this mission. And I really had only provisioned life support for two. Uh, so one way that we can actually fix this is we can fly over to the refueling station. Now, we don't really need fuel. This has its own ISRU, in, you know, in-situ resource utilization refinery. Uh, attached to it. So it's making its own fuel. However, that fueling station does have a probe body attached. So if we can attach the two spacecraft together, then both of the Kerbals can run into the lab and we can reset the instruments, we can refine the science, and we can perhaps report back with a little more fidelity than would otherwise be afforded by our limited capabilities. Now the only downside to this plan is that you do have to perform some very careful flying and put the two spacecraft within about 10 meters of each other. Now when you've targeted the other object you can just perform this like a rendezvous, right? You're just going to make sure that your velocity vector or your inverse velocity vector is always pointing at 
the target. However, once you get in close, you have to make sure you're using surface velocity rather than target relative velocity because target relative velocity is at least is still broken in this particular version here. This is an older version. And yes, thanks very much for everyone telling me that things are updated, but uh, I will not be able to update this for reasons which are beyond your ken. Or you can just pretend that I'm lazy if that makes it any easier. But here we go, just dropping ourselves in ever so carefully here, and look at that. Just This is a beautiful piece of flying, I have to say, in retrospect. Okay, Billy Bobkiss, get to work kiss and link kiss the spaceship kiss to each other kiss. That's obviously special Kerbal code language. So that other Kerbals that uh, aren't in on the special mission don't understand what's going on. So yes, grab this, fly it over there, because it's min -miss. We can afford to fly everywhere. Link them together. And now we have a spacecraft which has a brain. We see we've plugged it into its brain and now, yes, okay, start it mining some fuel because that helps. Temperature reads minty fresh. You make an addendum requesting that all future thermometers use numbers instead of wisecracks. Actually, processing this data isn't going to be that useful because we're not going to really transmit this back home. We're going to send it on a spacecraft back home in physical style so we get all the science we can. But it is a useful thing to pass the time as we're cleaning those other experiments. And indeed, we have a lot of time to pass on the surface as the spacecraft slowly refills its tanks, preparing for another jaunt across the surface to find new territories. Which, of course, represents a perfect time to go back to the surface for another aircraft test. Of course, we will be looking for a name for this, because EVE Explorer uh, has already been taken, and EVE Lander sounds kind of dull. So we're, we're just basically throttling up at 50% thrust this time, hoping to actually bring this around for a landing test. Uh, it does seem right now to have some issues with taking off, incidentally. You see, we've put some wings on the front as well, so that, uh, well, hopefully if it gets torn off, it will be able to fly on its own. Or something, we don't really know. And I do seem to be moving over to the side of the runway. Let's throttle all the way up, and we get into the air. And the gravity, the g-forces got pretty high for a moment there, but looks like we are off the ground. We now have air brakes installed for extra bonus points. We've uh, tweaked some of the wing setup. Uh, in fact, we removed an internal wing and shifted a canard forward. We obviously moved the landing gear around a little just to, to help it get off the ground a little, but I perhaps may need more landing gear. Landing gear is the single thing that I spend the most time adjusting on my aircraft. I will freely admit it. Somebody needs to come up with a landing gear tool to help people figure out whether their aircraft will take off and land at reasonable rates. Anyway, let's see how old me dealt with the landing. Okay, this approach is relatively solid here, and kind of low. Now, break, 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 and flare, flare, flare. On the runway, first time. This is looking like a good... Oh, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Turn, 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 turn. No, 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 no. Well, uh, at least, at least we didn't... We only lost wings there. That's better than some landings we've had. It's a good thing they're strapped in because it would look strange to look at their little portraits and see Bill falling over onto Jebediah. Anyway, back on Minmus, Billy Bobkus Kerman is detaching the umbilicals, restoring uh, internal power and all that stuff. Okay, that didn't work quite so gracefully. It's a good thing that he's not in charge of pulling out the umbilicals as the rocket leaves the pad. That is some serious hardware. I mean, people don't think about some of the really minor things or some of the really minor details that go in, but when rockets like the shuttle took off, you would have them plugged into their fuel system and their power system and everything until the very last second. And literally, as the engine is igniting, these things fall off and they get pulled back. And because they have like exposed panels and plugs and stuff on and there's a rocket about to fly by, they get pulled behind these steel shutters that slam down to protect them. 
And you know, somebody has to dis- design it and build that system and test it. And, uh, you know, if you look at some of the videos, there's uh, some great videos that show you because, of course, they have cameras to make sure that these things have retracted properly. And uh, so you get these really nice slow motion camera shots of the umbilicals getting pulled away, stowed, and the shutters closing before the giant rocket flies by and fries all their sensitive bits and pieces. Anyway, it appears that I've been confusing my Kerbals, and that was Sean Locke Kerbin, Ra- Kerman rather than Billy Bobkus Kerman. Can you forgive me for mixing those guys up? I mean, it's clear that they are not twins. It's not like there is a family resemblance between the two of them, is there? You see, completely different. Billy Bobkus and Sean Locke, completely different individuals, and I should not have confused them. So now we're looking for the highlands, and I think that there is a highland section on this little mountain here. So what we're doing is we're grabbing data, and we're looking for gravity data, and we're waiting for it to say, you are over highlands. And I think I may actually be flying past it. Now, it's always hard to tell because I don't really have a good relief map and biome map together in the same uh, device. Kerbal Maps doesn't do it for some reason. It should, darn it. But the only way to really check is to yeah, hit hit the gravity scan, and the gravity scan will tell you which biome you're over. Yes, as you pass overhead, the sensor does a sweep, but it is the greater flats. I don't know why there is nothing flat there. Oh, the highlands! Yes, as you pass overhead, you do science. But who cares about science because you're flooring the throttle. Do you floor the throttle in a spacecraft? You more you push it forwards or pull it back or something. I always remember Top Gun getting it wrong all the time, like, uh, you know, Tom Cruise, he would pull back the throttle and the afterburners would engage, and then he would push the throttle forwards and pull his stick back to engage the air brakes. Just made absolutely no sense. Of course, I make horrific uh, mistakes when I'm talking about aircraft all the time, so I really uh, can't talk. So yeah, you can see I'm more or less coming straight down. I killed all my lateral velocity. And we're just going to drop ourselves very carefully onto this little mountain. Now we're about five, or just under five kilometers tall at this point, although I could fly up and get a little higher if you like. These are the Highlands of Minmus. The high, oh, and this is the Highlander. The Highlander has come home to the Highlands. And carefully sets itself down. Look at, that is a nice area. And I accidentally jump into the cockpit. But it's a very nice view from here, nevertheless. Okay, now we're here. Deploy the science. The curvature of Minmus is easily visible from here. Why, yes, it is. I can totally tell you that we're on a a spherical planetoid. Okay, uh, what else do we have? We have... No, no, we don't want to do that. Yeah, we no. Wait a second. Did I just wipe that out? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay, we have... Seismic data, seismic waves, where data are, are detected. We still have seismic activity. We uh, we can't, oh, we got to pull that out before we override it. Temperature says, the temperature is just cold enough for a good ice cream cone. Given the mass of the Kerbal Sun, the entire system should be that cold. Uh, the low temperature has frozen one of the liquid samples into a sort of iced cream. Was it green before? And what does the mystery goo tell us? The goo turns into a scale model of Minmus and indicates the landing site with a little X. I have to say, whatever that goo is, it's clearly way smarter than me because I've no idea where I am half the time. As I pass overhead, the sensor does a sweep of the gravity. Yay! Okay, and as you suspect it, it's very cold here. Now it's time for Sean Locke to step outside and smell the carbon dioxide scrubbers. The inability to scratch your chin is making concentrating on the EVA nearly impossible. Indeed, if you can't scratch your chin, it makes me wonder how any good science can be possibly be done from a spacesuit. Chin scratching being, of course, one of the important exercises in focusing the mind so that you can do real science. Okay, Sean Locke, we're in the Highlands. Get us a sample. Ice up here has a very high reflectivity, which must significantly contribute to the high albedo of Minmus, because albedo and reflectivity are the same thing. It's hard to control your movements in the low gravity. 
It's also hard for me to think about uh, what we shall put on the flag. Out comes the flag. Bring forth the flag. Bring forth the flag. Bring... Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, since this ship is called the Highlander, we'll call it, say, the Highlander comes home. No, no, no. Let's say uh, the Highlander's home. And in the Highlands, obviously, right? Because that's where the Highlanders come from. So, whatever. By definition. So anyway, more science will be done over the coming few days, but of course now we're back to some testing on this as yet unnamed spacecraft. Uh, Bill Kerman, Jebediah Kerman, once again taking it out. Now we're going higher and faster than before, where it's going to fly in a ballistic arc and we're going to test the ability to pull out of steep dives and uh, then test the ability to glide. I think it actually does a pretty good job of flying when it doesn't fall apart. You know, as in, oh, well, it flies really well until it explodes. Seems to be a quite common sentiment with my spacecraft and aircraft. So, yeah, up to 30 plus kilometers here, and now we're coming down with the help of gravity. Not firing the engine anymore. We're hoping to not use the engine at all, but we'll find out. So, displacing the nose about 20 degrees. We're getting warnings about large angles of attack and side slip. It's good that I went just far enough to go over the mountains because I am not 100% sure that I would be able to pull out of this dive before crunching into a mountain. Uh, yeah, actually, no, we're doing pretty well. I wasn't, wasn't certain for sure, but we've definitely managed to pull out of this dive. Now I can turn around and we'll see what kind of glide slope we get from this thing because I want to try gliding back to the runway gracefully and silently and without spreading radiation over the lands nearby because I find that the people that are building the administration building and the mission control really don't like it when I scatter neutron radiation through the air. It ruins their sandwiches, giving them uh, something of a metallic taste, so I'm told. No, this is actually a legit phenomena. Um, you know, radiation actually damages your nerves and things like that and apparently induces a metallic taste for many, many things. It's been reported by a lot of people who have been exposed to radiation, either deliberately because of radiotherapy or by accident because such things happen. Anyway, uh, this thing glides exceptionally well, you know, and of course I've just accelerated this up to about 12 times regular speed. And uh, yeah, you've got, I've got the nose down just enough, and uh, speed is bleeding off slowly, but we're definitely able to make the distance in this thing, and, and indeed it gets us to the runway at just roughly the right speed needed for landing, which uh, old me will now commentate on. Okay, we're going still a little bit fast, but it looks deceptively slow because of Kraken's Bane. Gear out, lined up, just going to flare a little... Trying to keep my my sink rate about two to three meters per second. And now deploy the air brakes. Bump down a little. And that's good. That's good. Notice we have extra wheels to stop the roll. Put the roll. Nope, 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 nope. Oh, crikey. Whoa, that is way more spectacular than that other one. And it wasn't that much faster. Well, at least everyone has survived this uh, simulation because, uh, yeah, we need to continue working on this to resolve the design's problems. Okay, throttling up to 100% this time. We uh, have even more wheels on it. We now have eight sets of wheels, six in the main, and we can rock the thing back and forth to actually get ourselves off the ground a little easier. Now, I'm going to kind of test high angle of attack here and see how it stalls. There's going to be a lot of mucking around and hopefully not crashing. But of course, we uh, we can afford to lose these things. Okay, let's see how this thing deals with a stall. I'm going to cut the engines and apply the brakes and see what happens. Brakes, brakes, brakes. Now we're dropping down to 100. And minor stalling, large scale stall. Okay, that's interesting. Let's now start applying the power to try and bring this thing back under control. Sinking at about 50 meters per second, which means I have about 20 seconds to get out of this. And, well, the nice thing is the nose is coming up. Of course, that's not ideal for a stall. For a real aircraft stalling, you want to nose, you know, put the nose down to gain speed. 
This thing does have enough power to weight ratio that we can practically sit on it. Okay, I'm going to try... What I want to happen is I want the nose to drop. I just don't know how to get it out of this. It, it's sitting at super high angle of incidence. Ah, there we go. Yes, we have now the velocity and the nose lined up. We have recovered from the stall, so that is actually a pretty good sign. Uh, applying power, we can bring the aircraft back under control should we lose control of it. Okay, with all this extra landing gear, I would like to hope that we can land this thing safely, but I'm not hopeful just yet. As I said, landing gear is my big problem. I could, I keep tweaking landing gears to try and get good ones. Okay, I'm coming in way too low and at way too steep an angle and I need to get this thing lined up. This is not the best landing. Flare, flare. Okay, now we should get ourselves over the middle of the runway lined up. Apply the brakes just a touch. Just a touch. Not too much, not too much. Flare and touchdown. Ooh, we are actually touched down. Now let's see if I can apply the brakes without causing the thing to flip out of control. Yes, this is looking exceptionally good. We have a design which may work with a bit more tweaking. We will use this in a future episode, but until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.